so when we go through verses and when we go through books, Mitch, when we go through books, the important thing is that you guys recognize how important it is for you and us individually to be reading because really all you're getting when I speak or Darian or Quentin speaks is our interpretation, what the Holy Spirit said to us. And the fact of the matter is no verse of scripture is ever exhausted. There never gets to a point where there's just nothing more that the Holy Spirit has to say about it. Me and Darian could read the same verses. You guys could read the exact same verses and get totally different messages from it. And there will be times when you see a verse that you've seen a hundred times before, and all of a sudden it will, something will pop out to you that you haven't noticed before. So make sure that you're not settling just for the things that we say as we go through um, like Hebrews 12. Make sure you're looking into it on your own because the Holy Spirit might have something totally separate to say to you as you read the verses, right? All right, who's got Hebrews 12, 1 through 3? Me. Can you read it? Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with the perseverance that the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Okay, thank you. So this is really a verse that should be the story of our lives, to continuously see Christ, to continue to continually grow, um, to leave your sin behind, and to pursue God. Um, Jesus endured the cross because of the joy that he knew was coming. How much more should we be able to endure the things that we have to go through in this life, not having to be the cross, Knowing that at the end of our lives, at the end of all of this junk that will happen during our lives, we get to be united with Christ in heaven for eternity. We don't have to deal with the cross. So how much more should we be able to go through this life with that hope? Um, Paul talks in Corinthians um, about the race, referring to life. So we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, whoever has that verse. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run? but only one gets the prize, run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that, I, so that after I had, have preached to others, I myself, will not be disqualified for the prize. Thank you very much. Um, so Paul's referring to the race as life, um, with a prize at the end, urging you to live your life in preparation for being united with Christ in eternity. That's the prize of our life. That's why we live our life, is in preparation for being united with Christ. What Paul's saying here is don't just go through life having things come at you and focusing on anything but the prize. Focus on Christ fully, because that's all that's going to matter at the end of the day. Um, intentionally seek the Lord as one who is training for a sport. Pour your heart and energy into a life that is diligently seeking God. That's really what we should all be doing. Live life as if you're in training for something. And that something is being united with Christ. Um, live as he is here now. So my example, and I hate using this example, is I have been training for five years in college. Diligently studying taking exam after exam, taking class after class for years on end. I've been in school for five years. I'll be graduating this December. And I'm doing it all for an eight and a half by, okay, eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper that says I have a degree. That's what, that's what these five years of a lot of diligent hard work is gonna add up to. Um, at, the end of, at the end of my life, at the end of the day, this piece of paper ends up being completely mean, meaningless. It's gonna do nothing for me when I come face to face with the Lord. It's not gonna be, all right, guys, form a line. Uh, college graduates, you come to the front. You're going to enter into the kingdom of God first. It's not going to be anything like that. Which is really unfortunate that a degree is so important in the world that we live in that I have to spend five years of my life taking time away from my family to learn about business and learn about you know what I'm going to school for. How much more important are my interactions with the other students than my studies of management theories or business strategy? My, my interaction with people who aren't saved is far more important than getting an A in, on this exam or on that exam or, or getting my degree. My interactions with people are going to last, and I can have an impact on people. That's why school is important. Not because I'm going to get a piece of paper after spending five years working hard to get it. It's going to be my interactions with people and how I represent Christ while I'm there. The opportunities I have to share Christ with fellow students is far more significant than my grades.
or the piece of paper that I spend years to obtain. And this is the fact of the matter. And this can be said about a million things in this world. We can spend our lives, and Satan has set up our, our country and our culture in a way where you can spend your life on things that are, at the end of the day, wandering aimlessly, as Paul describes it. You can spend your life just going left and going right and looking at all these different things, trying to get this and trying to get that, and it's really just going to amount to absolutely nothing because you will come face to face with God, and the only thing that matters is how you lived your life for him. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Okay, so this is just one verse, but this is, this is a huge, huge verse. Who here has ever had to endure any time on the cross for the sin that they've committed? All right, this is a heavy part that really stuck out to me. Take a second to think about this question of verse 4. How much more seriously would we take sin if we had to shed our own blood in order to be forgiven? How much we take for granted the suffering and the blood of Jesus when we sin? Guys, sometimes we sin pretty flippantly. And we don't have to shed a single drop of blood when we sin because Jesus did it. We take that for granted. If we had to suffer, if we had to spend just one brief moment on the cross every time we sin, I bet you we would take sin a lot more seriously, wouldn't we? I think we need to think about that a lot more because Jesus was a real human being who endured real suffering. He wasn't separated from that suffering because he was also God. He experienced every bit of pain that we would experience if we were on the cross for hours. And then he died. I think that's something we need to let sink in. Because I know that sometimes I'm a little too flippant with sin. Sometimes I, I let things slip, not realizing that I should have been the one to die on the cross. And quite frankly, I could end this whole chapter right there because that's huge. And that's something that I want all of us to take away. Go for it. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as a, his son. Great. All right. Who likes the idea of being disciplined by God? The, the writer of Hebrews is, is using discipline as a source of encouragement. He says, don't lose heart. Have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? And then it goes on to the Lord disciplining us. The writer of Hebrews is saying that it should be encouraging to you that you should ever be disciplined by the Lord because the Lord only disciplines people that he loves. Some people have a hard time with the concept of God as a father um, because so many of our fathers didn't stick around. They bailed on us. Um, they bailed on our mothers. So for a lot of people, when they think of a father figure, they're thinking of something very broken, broken and something that's done a lot of damage to them emotionally. So for some people, picturing God as a father is a scary sight, a scary thought, something that they, they don't want to associate God as being a father. But let me reassure you that no matter what type of father you have on this earth, his flaws are not a reflection at all on the type of father that we have in heaven in God. God is a father that will never leave us nor forsake us. He doesn't bail on us. Those are his words. He says, I will never leave you or forsake you. He will always forgive us. He disciplines us out of love, not out of uncontrolled anger, which probably most of us have seen. He loves us with a sacrificial love, unlike anything that we have from an earthly father. He has love for us that is pure and that is unconditional and that is not based on his current mood or how we act. Like, I've literally gotten emotional disciplining my daughter because I hate having to do it. It really makes me sad. Um, I want to cry when I see her up, upset a lot of times. Um, it hurts me emotionally to have to discipline her. But I love her and I'm aware of what could happen, so I do it. I know the importance of disciplining her, so I do it out of love. There was one occasion where we had a very close call. We were going to the car, which was parked on the side of the road right in front of our house. Her car seat was on the side of the car that was sticking out into the road. When we left the house, she was walking right next to me, and as we got closer, she randomly took off running towards the car right into the road, like in a split matter of seconds, because kids do that. Without thinking, they just take off. Um, there was a truck coming down the street towards her right as she ran into the road. Like, right at the, like they were meeting up right at the, at the, the wrong moment. Um, it had only a split second to react. Luckily, the driver was paying attention and managed to slam on his brakes about two feet away from her. And she could have died. Like she, my, my daughter very, very realistically could have died. Um, my reaction, however, was not to start screaming at her. 
and to not take away everything in the world that she liked or to have her sit a million in six minutes and to give her a two hour lecture about how that was wrong. I ran over to her and I scooped her up in my arms and I wept. I'm talking, I bawled in my front yard holding her for a long time because it, I was shaken. I was scared of what almost just happened. I didn't yell at her. You might say, oh, you're disciplining her. You're probably just gonna scream at her. No way. Because that's not the love of a father. This is the love that God for, has for us as his children. When we sin, when we mess up, he doesn't stand over us and scream at us. He doesn't do that. His heart is broken. He disciplines us out of love because he is fully aware of what's going on, even when we're not paying any attention. God, the creator of heaven and earth. Does everybody realize that God created heaven and earth? Okay. God who created every blade of grass outside and all these intricate cell systems and everything that allows any form of life and all the oceans and all the trees and everything that's beautiful in this world created you, intentionally you. And that's true for every single one of us here. Why? Because he loves us deeply. Mitch, he decided that you should exist in this world, so he created you. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> and he gave us a dairy. And he gave us that. every single one of us intentionally <laughs> out of love. When we fall short and fall into sin, Satan wants us to believe that God is standing there angry and waiting to scream at us for what we've done. But the reality is God knows what sin does to us, and it breaks his heart. And he wants to hold us weeping when we fall, like I held my daughter. He wants to pick us up, and he wants us to realize what happened. And he wants it to never happen again. But he's not angry with us. His, his anger was taken out on Jesus on the cross when he took, he, he took our sin. I wasn't angry with my daughter. I wasn't angry with her for a second. I was scared of what just happened. And so I held her in my arms and I cried for a while. And this is why in verse 5, it describes discipline as encouraging. It's a reminder that God loves us. A father that does not discipline his child does not love his child. If I didn't love Madison, I'd go play on the road. I would have given up. I don't feel like disciplining her. It takes too much energy. It makes me sad. I'm just not going to say anything to her. I love her way too much to do that. How much more perfect is the discipline of God? If me, a flawed human father, loves her that much to discipline her, how, how much more pure is God's discipline of us? Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for that, for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at, at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Prior to my girlfriend becoming pregnant, I was a self-proclaimed follower of Christ. I was a Christian, I said I was a Christian. Um, we dated for three years before we became pregnant and I struggled with sexual temptation. The Lord spoke to me many times about sin. I was in the word, I was in prayer, and I still let this sin run rampant in my life. Um, and the Lord spoke to me many times about it. And I convinced myself every time that I fell short that it would be the last time. This would be the last time I messed up. I would never do it again, I would never let it happen again. And then, of course, it happened again. God saw that gentle reminders and explanations wasn't going to sink into this child's mind. So he began to discipline me. Eventually, after a few years of allowing that sin in my life, my girlfriend got pregnant. I have to balance doing homework. And this is just college we're talking about. I have to balance doing homework and those obligations with work, with having a family. I'm still very much impacted by the choices that I made. God disciplined me. And it has produced character in me that would have only come through that discipline, and God knew that. As a result of having a child that young, I had to mature quickly. I had to learn a lot of patience. I had to learn to not get angry so quickly. And I had to learn a lot of other, other things that would have only come from me having a child. So God disciplined me, guys. Don't get me wrong. I love my daughter with all my heart, as my example showed earlier. I love her. I would die for her like that in a second, not even thinking about it. But the fact of the matter is that it was a form of discipline. But it was out of love, and it produced character, character in me. God has blessed us tremendously with our daughter and me with my family. 
So do not get me wrong. God has turned that into a very fruitful, beautiful thing because I repented and because I turned around and, and sought him with it. I didn't turn away from him. That's why we didn't end up being one of these, um, or one of the typical teenage parents who get an abortion or end up separating like a lot of people do. It was because we sought God in it. And so God was faithful to us, even though it was a form of discipline. So don't let discipline do these things to you. Don't let it disable you. Don't let it harm you. That's what Satan wants. He wants us to feel weak and disabled when God disciplines us. And I felt that way for a long time. After finding out my, my girlfriend was pregnant, I felt that way for a long time. God wants nothing to do with me. He disciplined me in that way because, man, he, he probably didn't even love me anymore. He punished me, and he wants nothing to do with me. I believed that for a long time, and, and Satan got his way with that for a long time because I stopped seeking the Lord after I found out my girlfriend was pregnant. Don't let that happen. I had no idea what God had in store for us. Otherwise, I would have never had that attitude towards him after finding out. Uh, I had no clue what God had in store for, for my wife and my daughter. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Make every effort Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. All right. Does anybody in here feel holy? Didn't think so. I'm not raising my hand either. Um, I wouldn't say that I lead a necessarily holy life. I would probably guess that you guys don't feel like you lead a necessarily holy life either. But here it says, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. What that tells me is that holiness is no joke. It's not just some side thing. Holiness must be pretty important because nobody will see it without the Lord. What does it mean to be holy? And I need some hands raised. Anybody have an idea? What does it mean to be holy? You can guess. You can be wrong. You're probably going to be right. Gwen! Be of God. To be of God. Um, to walk in the light, which is to love in... Ah, to walk in love and truth. To walk in love and truth. Well, being pure. Yeah. Uh, set apart. Set apart. Anybody else? Well, blameless. Can we live a holy life if we're living in sin? No. Sin is unholy. That is the very opposite. That's the polar opposite to being holy. What about the word righteous? So th these are the words that come to mind when I think of holiness. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. So seek to live a pure life. Seek to live a blameless life. Seek to live a life that emulates Jesus, a life that emulates God. Are you seeking a life of purity and holiness? Are, are purity and holiness things that are important to you in your life? Are they things that you're seeking to be? Do you recognize things in your life that aren't pure, that aren't holy? And are you seeking to end those things in your life and to put a stop to them or are you completely fine with them because without holiness no one will seek the lord because other than, other than jesus we'd have no hope at all but think about that verse without holiness no one will see the lord and think about your life and what parts of it may be holy and what parts might not be and seek to be holy seek to be pure and to leave all your sin in your past see to it that no one falls short of the grace of god and that no better root grows up to cause trouble and defile men. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau. For a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to in inherit this blessing, he was rejected. Even though he sought the, the blessing with tears, he could not change what he had done. Esau was the brother of Jacob. These are old, very important Old Testament figures. Um, Esau was the firstborn and therefore had the birthright of being the firstborn son, which in our American culture doesn't mean a darn thing. So when we read that verse, we're probably going to end up scratching our head and saying, okay, it's in the Bible, so I believe that. I really don't know what it means. Being the firstborn in the Old Testament in Israel was a big deal. There were certain rights that you got that none of your siblings would get as being the firstborn. It was a place of significance. To be the firstborn, it meant that you had special honor in the family. It meant that you got double the portion of paternal inheritance. Basically what that means is if you have siblings and your parents die and you would inherit everything <coughs> from them, you would get double what all of your other siblings would get. So being the firstborn was an extremely important thing. It's something that, that you held very closely and that everybody recognized that you were the firstborn. It's a very important place to be. Esau, in a moment of hunger, sold his birthright to his younger brother, Jacob. 
for a single meal. Esau let his, temp his momentary desire have a huge impact on his life, and he lost his birthright to Jacob and everything that went with it. How does somebody sell something intangible? A birthright wasn't like a degree where it was a piece of paper that said, here, you're the firstborn son, you have this birthright here, you can have it. It wasn't like that, it was a concept. And um, Jacob wanted to be the firstborn, he wasn't. He wanted the inheritance, he wanted everything that came with being the firstborn. So Jacob said, okay, you can have this meal, you give me your birthright. Basically what that means is you give me absolutely everything and you can have a meal. And because Esau was hungry, he, he let that momentary desire have a gigantic impact on the rest of his life. And so he said, okay, fine, fine, fine. Here, here's my, here's my inheritance. Here's my, um, here's my role as being the firstborn son. Just give me some food. Do not let momentary desires dictate your decisions. Guys, live planfully and live wisely. Especially being young like we are, it's really easy to be impulsive and to let something that we want in a second cause us to make a bad decision or to go off course. Do everything you do intentionally and don't ever get caught up, caught up in the moment. I've done a lot of things wrong because I got caught up in the moment. I wanted something. I knew it wasn't good for me, but at that moment I wanted it and so I did it. Do not live like that because that is straight up foolishness. Don't give up your inheritance to the kingdom of God for the things of this world. As Mark puts it in Mark 8.36, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet lose their soul? The soul, your soul is the most important thing you have. Eternity with God, this. Our life on, uh, more than this. Our life on planet Earth in this spectrum, maybe, maybe that much, okay? It's nothing compared to our life with Jesus in eternity, okay? So we need to remember that. Don't let this little moment of hunger, of desire, impact your inheritance in the kingdom of God. Focus on all this. It's so much more important. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it beg begged that no further word be spoken to them, because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. Okay, let me paint a picture for you real quick. This is Old Testament. This is when, when God came down and revealed himself to Moses on Mount Sinai. It was a terrifying event for the people. God said, don't let anybody touch this mountain. If they do, they got to be put to death. Even if it's an animal and they step foot on this mountain, they're to be put to death. So it was a terrifying event. And the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready for by the third day, because on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai, Sinai. Sinai and in the sight of all the people. Put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, be careful that you do not approach the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain is to be put to death. There are, they are to be stoned or shot with arrows. Not a hand is to be laid on them. No person or animal shall be permitted to live. Only when the ram's horn sounds a long blast may they approach the mountain. Hebrews is referencing the verse that we just read in Exodus. Okay? So it was a terrifying event. It wasn't, it wasn't pleasant. It wasn't joyful and happy. It was like God's coming down to reveal himself to Moses. We have to stay away from, we have to consecrate ourselves. We have to wash all of our clothes. We have to make sure that we're being pure. We have to make sure that nothing goes wrong and we can't touch the mountain or we have to be put to death. This was a terrifying event. But you have come to my Mount Zionai? Zion? Zion. Zion. To the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to all the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of, the, of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that seeks uh, that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. So we're talking about two different mountains. We're talking about Mount Sinai, a very fearful event of when God marked His covenant with man through Moses, and then it's refer and then it's talking about Mount Zion, heaven, um, which is a joyful experience. It says the heavenly. Um, you have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, versus a mountain where if you touch, you got to be put to death. So. What's being compared here in Hebrews is the two covenants. The covenant that was originally set out in blood, which is a fearful thing, and the covenant that was set out in joy, which is the new covenant, which is the covenant that we have with God, where if we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we will be united with God in heaven, with Jesus in heaven. So that's um, referring to those two things. He is describing the fear that came upon God's people under the law, under the first covenant, 
and the joy of God's people under the new covenant for those who are saved by the blood of Christ. Uh, the new covenant is established in joyful rejoicing while the old covenant was established in fear. That's what the two mountains are referring to. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? In other words, do not take lightly the word spoken by Jesus. No, no one escapes who denied him while he was on the earth. None of the people that heard him speak and who said, okay, that, that's, that's rubbish. None of those people escaped. They didn't just walk away and the rest of their lives were fine. More so, no one will escape who denies and rejects him now that he is in heaven. Ruling over all the earth, no one's going to escape. The words of Jesus, even if spoken 10,000 times in church, because we hear the same things in church a real lot, should never lose their significance. Never take for granted the words of Jesus ever. Because every one of them is vital. And be careful not to grow weary of repeated verses, repeated worship. Um, because people who deny God and take his word for granted and reject him, they're not escaping anything. They might do well in this life. They might have a nice home and all that junk. They're not escaping at all. So don't be deceived by looking at people who reject God and who seem to be doing well in this life. Because that's all that they've got. And there will be a day when it all burns away and they've got nothing left. And that's no joke. At that time, his voice shook the earth. But now he has, he has a promise. Once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate that the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that we cannot be shaken may remain. Or so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful, and so worship God acceptably, acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. These verses are referring to... Matthew 27, 50 through 51. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. So Hebrews, which is referring to Matthew, which is later referred to in Revelation, <laughs> See how it all connects? Uh, it all just shows you how legitimate it is when there's so many different references. That's not, you know, not all these separate stories. It's consistent through various authors over various books over various periods of time. It's all consistent. I think it, what, what it was referring to was the, because it said the new heaven and new earth. Um, the heaven, I think it was referring to the heaven that's there now will be shaken. The, yeah. the, the, the skies and the, the heavens, everything will be shaken. But the, new the place, created. yeah, the new one that, that God is creating for us, you know, in the new heaven and the new earth, like that is going to be a place where he's going to build his new Jerusalem, where, where God will be, his presence will be, and that's where we'll live forever. And that's what that's heaven. That's where heaven, heaven is. That, yeah. The new heaven. The that's, new heaven. The new earth. To, like yeah. it says, uh, indicating the removing of what can be shaken. Yeah. That is created things so that what cannot be shaken may remain. So like you, if you take something right and like let's say it's like got like all like this stuff on it right and you start shaking it, shaking it until all the little flakes and stuff blow off and then like the last thing that's left is the only thing like still there that's still solid, right? So all the other stuff is all gone away. So the only thing is there is the solid piece, right? So that is. There's, that's a, that's a good example. There's no possibility of us getting to heaven and seeing that it was ruined and that it was overtaken by, by anybody or anything. It's, it's there and it's going to be there. It was created by the creator of the universe. There's, there's nothing that can take it away from us. There's nothing at all. It will be there. And you can, be, you can have full reassurance of that. Um, that's it. I'm just going to summarize. So live life intentionally as if you're training to be united with God in heaven. I mean, that should be the number one goal, the number one priority is training for that. Grow as closely to God in this world as you possibly can because you're going to be reunited with him in heaven for all eternity. Um, think about the fact that it should have been our blood and our suffering for our sins. Every time you sin, every time you, you face temptation, think about that fact. 
One minute on the cross, 20 seconds on the cross every time you sit. Imagine that. God is a good father. Accept his discipline for what it is. It's love, and it's to build character in us. It's not out of anger. It's not out of disappointment. Know that you are his child. You are God's, more than, more than your parents on earth, you're even more so God's child. Know that he loves you, and seek to live a holy life, preparing for unity with God. Seek to be like God. As I said at the beginning of this message, every one of us in here could read the exact same few verses and get something totally different from them, from them because God isn't limited like we are. Um, so Quentin, next week, will be giving a message on uh, on a few uh, verses that I covered because the Holy Spirit said something totally different to him. So so next week, Quentin will be giving a message on, on, on Hebrews 12 again, and then we're going to move on. Another thing I want to say is we spend we do spend a lot of time making these messages and choosing the wording very carefully and the progress very carefully so i just ask for respect and just but there's a time when we have to focus on why we're here which is because god has things to say to us so let's keep that at the forefront of our mind okay i'm done <laughs> that's it no more words coming out of my mouth give me a kick cup of coffee give me a word that rocks me a whole lot of jesus and a little caffeine